Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, the professors with me on stage are brilliant scholars in their fields who also have a full life on Twitter. And we're here to talk about what that means for their intellectual, social, professional, and personal lives. This introduction was 280 characters. <laughs> <laughs> So um, there are a lot of uh, conversations about what academics are doing on Twitter. Um, this is a fairly good uh, representation of some of the, um, some of the more immediate uses, um, from procrastinating, gossiping about people in one's field, uh, having interactions with people they have an intellectual crush on. But um, because Twitter's been around for a while now, and academics have been on it for a while, um, we've, there've been a lot of uh, reactions in the press about, um, and, in the, and in the scholarly press about um, what, whether this is good or bad. What, what, what's the, um, what are the purposes? Is it, you know, the, the, the scholar, for instance, um, of that New York Times op-ed, the one that with quit social media, your career may depend on it, said he's a young Georgetown professor named Cal Newport, he wrote, the idea of purposefully introducing into my life a service designed to fragment my attention is as scary to me as the idea of smoking would be to uh, an endurance athlete. And it should be to you if you're serious about creating things that matter. Well, we have some differing opinions among our uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, Teresa Shaheen is doing the work that so many, so many of us talk about. She's the, Sheila and, and, and uh, Teresa is in the green, green here. Um, she's the inaugural Sheila and Ron Mar uh, Marcello Lecturer in Social Entrepreneurship, the author of Introduction to Social Entrepreneurship, a 12-step framework for building impactful ventures in new and existing organizations. Her research focuses on developing tools to characterize and advance social and environmental determinants of health. She also launched the first social entrepreneurship program in the context of public health at Harvard, she was responsible for launching the first venture philanthropy organization in her home country of Lebanon, providing tailored financial and critical management support to social enterprises, serving marginalized populations through education and job creation for youth and women. Uh, if Alexander Hamilton had Twitter, then he would be retweeting Joanne Freeman. <laughs> Uh, she is professor of history and American studies and is a leading expert on Amer early American politics and culture. The author of the award-winning Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic, and editor of Alexander Hamilton, Writings in the Essential Hamilton. Her work informed the writing of Broadway's Hamilton. A co-host of the popular American history podcast Backstory, which I recommend everyone download immediately after exiting this conference. <laughs> and a commenta commenter on documentaries on PBS and the History Channel. She also has an activist interest in public-minded history. Her most recent book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to Civil War, was a New York Times notable book of 2018 and a finalist for the Lincoln Prize. Michael Krauss, uh, in, uh, there, holding the coffee cup, is um, an ex exceptionally prolific scholar and is also an exceptionally prolific tweeter. He is an assistant professor at um, the School of Management, trained as a social, psychology, uh, social personality psychologist at Berkeley, where he received his BA in psychology and sociology and, BA and PhD in social psychology. Before arriving at Yale, he was a postdoc at UC San Francisco and then at University of Illinois. His research can be found in leading psychology journals and has been featured in media outlets like the Ta New York Times, New York Magazine, Wall Street Journal, NPR, ABC World News. Um, Michael is active on Twitter, as you will soon learn, where he shares research news and comments on politics and social inequality. Fiona Sc uh, Scott Morton, next to me, has been justly called a rock star for portraying discipline, economic literacy, and concern for enforcement in the consumer interest. She was recently named a radical by the New Republic. Undeserved. <laughs> uh, uh, she teaches economics at, at the School of Management, where she's been on the faculty since 1999. Uh, her area of research is empirical in industrial organization with a focus on empirical studies of competition in areas like pricing, entry, and product differentiation. Her published articles range widely across industries, from magazines to shipping to pharmaceuticals to internet retailing, and are published in leading economic journals. 
Um, from 2011 to 2012, Professor Scott Morton served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics at the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where she helped enforce the nation's antitrust laws. Yale SOM, she teaches courses in the area of competitive strategy, and many other honors. <laughs> um, and uh, um, you can see um, a, a little bit of her uh, mo most recent uh, uh, tweets here. And finally, um, Jason Stanley uh, knows the world is on fire, but he can laugh about it. Uh, he's the Jacob Borowski pro Professor of Philosophy at Yale University, the author of five books, most recently, How Fascism Works, the winner of the 2007 Academic Philosophical Association Book Prize for his 2005 book, Knowledge and Practical Interests. He writes on propaganda, authoritarianism, mass incarceration, free speech, and other issues for the Times, Boston Review, Washington Post, Chronicle of Higher Ed, and other publications. He serves on the board of the Prison Policy Initiative. Uh, now, before we get into our serious discussion of uh, Twitter and all that it um, can do for the prof for professors in their in their serious lives, we know what um, how things can uh, end up often going. Um, so I'd like to start by asking each of the panelists how they started on Twitter and, and how they use it now. Fiona? Okay, sure. Um, I joined Twitter because Steve Barry guilted me into it. Uh, he, he said uh, people were asking where are all the IO economists on Twitter. There don't seem to be any, and that was true. There really weren't. So I joined, uh, and I use it really entirely as a work platform. I don't do anything social on Twitter. Well, occasionally, someone in my group will say, you know, I got a journal article, or here's the bar cart. We're having a happy hour, whatever. But that's pretty uh, infrequent. Mostly, I use it as a work platform, um, both to uh, comment on the economics of policy, mostly antitrust uh, enforcement or healthcare um, kind of policy choices made by the government. And then also, uh, I feel that it's a way to keep in touch with former students who were interested in the material in my class, and which is related to current events, and I can keep telling them about how that class material relates to current events. So that's, that's, really, um, that's really how I use it, and I find it to be really great in that way. Um, I, I, I think I, because of using it as a work vehicle, I don't have much of the snarky piling on stuff that seems to happen in the rest of Twitter, and I only follow about 50 people, most of whom don't tweet very much, so that, that I'm getting just the events in my field coming into my uh, feed. Thank you. Joanne? I am having a very different Twitter experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, I first got on Twitter um, pretty much against my will. Um, I'm low tech, slow tech. And uh, I wasn't even on Facebook. And I did, I don't know if any of you have heard of the op-ed project, but um, it's a great project that's um, getting women and people of color out into the world being public commentators and writing op-eds. So I did that here at Yale. And they insisted that everyone who's in the program have a social media presence. And in the session that we were in, in the class, they said, right now, you're all going to sign up for Twitter while you're sitting right here, and you're going to tweet something, which I did and then basically didn't really know what to do with it. Um, I got a sense of what it could do um, during the last presidential election. Um, I think before that I was probably tweeting out occasional interesting historical things I found, new databases that I thought you know, colleagues would like, um, interesting pieces of historical evidence that I found. But um, I, during the election, I guess there was a particularly strident attack against the judiciary. And I went on Twitter, and I even apologized. I said, um, I know we all know this, but I feel the need to talk about checks and balances, the balance of power, and why the separation of powers is important in this country at, so that you understand why attacking the judiciary is a bad thing. And I didn't, I guess I sort of assumed, I, I apologize because I thought a lot of my colleagues would be looking at it, but it, I was going insane with, Anyway, I sent that out there, and I got this stream of a huge response from the public saying, thank you for explaining that to us. Hmm. And it dawned on me, number one, people didn't necessarily know that. And number two, what an incredible teaching tool. Right, in that moment, like, that something important was communicated, who knows how many people, 
But so um, I use it for a variety of different ways. I keep in touch with colleagues. I stay on top of you know news and also things about my field. But I feel really aggressively that I speak to the public about history, about the government. Um, I, I use a lot of documents, so I'm not screaming. I actually very deliberately am not screaming. I'm very um, <clears throat> low key, and I try to not allow emotion to be on there at all. This morning I woke up and I said, good morning. I'm going to send out the presidential oath of office for people to see. <laughs> Here you go. And I didn't say anything more than that, really. I then connected things to it and said more than that. But at any rate, um, it's, a, it's an incredible teaching tool. That's my main takeaway. I think you told me your second follower, or your first follower, was Lin-Manuel Miranda. My, my second, yeah, so, yeah. So the, the one thing I did on Twitter was um, I knew two people on Twitter. I knew my friend and my friend who had told me that he was on Twitter. Um, and so when I joined it and I made my one tweet and then I went to find my friend and then I thought the only other person I know who's on here is Lin-Manuel Miranda. And he happened to make an Alexander Hamilton joke right when I beamed in and I responded. <laughs> And he was like, Joanne Freeman. And then suddenly I was like, whoa, there are all these people. There's a conversation. So yeah. Very cool. Teresa. So I first joined Twitter as a postdoctoral research fellow when I was uh, and it's just graduated from public health. And I wanted to connect with the social entrepreneurship community. I was in a university that's very siloed um, in terms of discipline. And the different graduate schools don't really talk to each other. And social entrepreneurship isn't really or at least at the time, wasn't really an academic discipline. It's people who have studied public policy or public health or management, and they're all working in this innovative cross-cutting area. And so that's what I was using Twitter for mostly, to find out who the key stakeholders are, what different people were doing, um, and to just get involved in the conversation. So I started following institutions that support social entrepreneurs and people out there doing what I thought were amazing, daring, bold things and just learning about what's going on and how are people doing things differently. Because I had a very mainstream academic upbringing and I just wanted to kind of break the silos. So that's really what it means to me. It's about breaking silos, extending beyond your academic discipline and creating, if not new disciplines, then just new ways of doing things, talking to the unusual suspects um, and hearing different voices and opinions. And I also use it a lot to bridge my two worlds because I come from Lebanon and I spend a lot of time there and my grassroots work is there. For a while I was running the Twitter and all the social media of my organization, Al Fanar, which means Lighthouse in Arabic. Um, it's a venture philanthropy organization. So I learned a lot about comms and social media at the time because I had to become savvy about what works and what doesn't and when do people see their Twitter feed and how you should always have a photo and those types of things that I had no idea about because I'm trained as a number cruncher basically. And so, um, so yeah, I learned to enjoy it and then um, when I um, created a textbook based on my course on social entrepreneurship, I realized it's a good way to share it and hear what people think and that's when I learned that it's a great way to build a new community because I started getting tweets from people who would say, oh, I'm on the second page of this book and I know I'll use it in my course. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. And then I reached out to that person and we Skyped and we became friends and we met up at a conference and then I helped her get into a fellowship and she helped me think through things. And so now she's one of my closest friends and colleagues just from a tweet. Um, so those kinds of things, I feel that you know there can be magic that happens on Twitter. So I'm not a frequent user. I mostly just create lists. Like when I came to Yale, I created a Yale list that I try to check as often as I can. Um, I think it's a great way to connect with people. Michael. So um, I, I guess I've been on Twitter for more than 10 years. Um, and then I was a graduate student when I started. So you can imagine if you think you have something to say, there's not necessarily people who are interested in what you're saying at that time. So, um, so I think early on, Twitter was more of a, a way to curate news for me. So I was reading it, understanding it. If there, there weren't a lot of people in uh, anybody's field on Twitter early on, um, so, it, so the platform kind of grew into a place where you could, like uh, what some of uh, the other people here are saying, like connect to people in your field, be updated on current events, be updated on um, you know, current studies in your field, and then um, sort of you know, over the course of your, um, your career, people start listening to you 
And so my use of the platform sort of starts to change to be more of like what, what am I gonna say in this space? Um, there's a lot of discourse. How can you use your science and your research and your scholarship to inform that discourse? So it's uh, taken on more of that, although it's still, um, for me at least, like dad jokes as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Jason. So, so I'm one of the few humanists on Twitter who's not a historian. Uh, so historians <laughs> have been making their mark, Joanne and uh, Kevin Krauss and others. Uh, I avoided Twitter. I was a Facebook person, and I had this Facebook account that had all the editors of the major newspapers and magazines on it, and that's where I did my, my work and shared pictures of my kids. Uh, and, then the right, and then I had a, uh, a, a Facebook post that a, it was a private Facebook post, but the right wing somehow screenshot it, and there was like 20 articles in the right wing press, and I got all this hate stuff, and I started realizing I probably shouldn't have a page that has pictures of my family, and so I deleted my Facebook account. This was in fall 2016, uh, and then and I wanted a platform that would force me never to uh, do anything personal. <laughs> because everyone, as my eight-year-old says, Daddy, everyone can see Twitter. So, so <laughs> unlike Facebook, where, where actually you are being watched because there's going to be people, uh, like in the middle of that firestorm, I had someone contacted me from, contact me from a security agency. And he said, take your Facebook page down immediately. And I said, why? He said, right now, every comment and post for the last nine years is being screenshot for future articles about you. And so I thought, oh, that's an excellent reason. So, uh, so Twitter gives me an opportunity to do my anti-fascist work, uh, but without revealing where I am, without revealing any personal details uh, of my life. Uh, and I don't have any social media that does that. So uh, since Twitter is visible by everyone, how do you feel about interacting with the general public? Um, do you, what's your approach to them? Do you feel like you're using it as a teaching tool generally? Joanne, you mentioned that, um, and Teresa. Um, do, you know, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen everyone, uh, almost everyone here, um, interact with friends, colleagues, uh, people they know kind of personally. How do you code switch from speaking to um, just a small group of, of people to like everyone? Well, there's, there's two flavors of Twitter. I mean, it's still just as public, but I think one of the ways in which you can communicate the message that you send when you use it is, I'm not being as public, right? So you can send something out to the entire world or you can just respond to one person. Now, everyone can look at the thing you sent to that one person, but it's not beamed out automatically everywhere. So I, that's a little bit of code switching. Um, you know, I think it's really easy to forget and underestimate the degree to which, like your kid said, people really see everything. You know, they re and, and there have been moments um, this morning. Um, this morning, uh, George Conway, Kellyanne Conway's husband, said, said something about uh, the ABC interview yesterday with the president in which he said he would take information and maybe go to the FBI. And Conway said, um, the president just said he might take information, foreign information. And I said, no, it's not a maybe, which he then retweeted. And I don't know what's happening right now on Twitter. <laughs> Let's check. I know. Uh, anyway. Um, so. I just replied to him, but he retweeted it, and now I don't. Stuff. I mean, yeah. I think the problem with platforms like this is you can't code switch. There is nothing. It's it, you have one message. It goes to everybody, right. and you have to think very carefully about how. I I spend a long time composing my Twitter messages because they have to be read. The tone of voice has to be exactly right, read by anybody from any background, for any language, in any mood, for accuracy, any time of day. Right? Because it's going to be quoted back to me yep. one mm -hmm. day. So you, I, I have deleted, I have composed and not sent many Twitter messages. It's just not safe. Uh, so it's, I, I, my own you know, personal conversation is way more lively than my Twitter feed. But you can't do that. That's really not wise. Yeah, if you think about what George, some of the academics who have been taken down by the right for their tweets, it, it clearly, like take George Corcurella Meyer. His tweet was, all I, want, wanted for, all I want for Christmas is white genocide. It's clearly sarcastic. 
It's clearly making a joke that there's no white genocide. I mean, I talked to him after that. He had like 24 seven intense harassment. Uh, you know, the president of his university denounced him for a clearly sarcastic tweet. So sarcasm doesn't, you know, they will take it completely out of context and it's totally irrelevant what you say afterwards. So you need, you need to be very clear that, like I try to be very earnest on Twitter. And as, a, as a, an academic, you also have to think not just tone, but factually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess this is particularly true for me as a historian. If I want to say, you know, if you asked the founders this, they probably would have said that. Like, I, I, again, that's within the last day or two I did that. And then I went back and I said, I, I was going to say, they would have said, and then I said, no. They probably Many of them would have. would have, right, because they all wouldn't have said it, and somebody would come back at me, and then there'd be a conversation. So you do have to think about every word. Uh, you really have to think about your tone. Yeah. I would say every day I write and undo tweets that um, make perfect sense to me and I wish I could say them and then it's just not right. smart. Correct. Okay. And notoriously, Twitter does not have an edit button and yeah. that can be good in a way because people can't do things over. They have to delete and rewrite. Michael, you've written a lot about racial um, inequality gaps and um, what, do you get a lot of, uh, do, you, do you get online harassment? Do you get people who are attacking you? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess the thing that sort of motivates a lot of what I write about on, on Twitter and, and my tone is like, so I, I guess the, maybe the strongest motivation is to be truthful and be factual. So I spend a lot of time just thinking like, what's the truth here? Um, and that's what motivates what I say. Um, I think that there's a, a little bit of a difference in scale to where my, my harassment's not gonna rise to the level of, uh, of other people because I just don't have the magnitude of microphone. Um, uh, so it's not as, um, it's not as intense. Um, have, you had, have you blocked people? Uh, you, uh, sure, um, yeah, it's, it's healthy to do that. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's just something you monitor and, and you're, you know, you're, you're trying to be careful, but you're also trying to be truthful. And I think that's, um, and you're trying to be yourself um, in ways that it's allowed on the platform. At least that's, that's how I use it. But also, you know, you're, you're tweeting because you want to communicate something, and sometimes it's just to a colleague or giving out information, but sometimes it's because, you know, people need to understand checks and balances now, right? Yeah. I mean, to teach, right? Yes. You, and again, you don't know how many people are reading it, but, um, wow, that's dramatic. Um, but, but again, I guess I talked about it as a teaching tool. It's a remarkably powerful teaching tool. Yeah, thousands of people. Right. Uh, tens of thousands of people. And um, I've been on a book tour in the fall that whole semester, and everywhere I went were people who knew me from Twitter, commented about things I'd said on Twitter. Young women who liked seeing a woman say things in public. There were all kinds of ways in which it just didn't dawn on me the impact of, of what you do on Twitter. That's interesting. Teresa, do, do you find it empowering? Um, to, to, do you feel like you're using your teaching voice, your kind of uh, nonprofit organizing voice, both your personal voice? I actually have a lot of anxiety about tweeting. Um, I think that, well, there's two, there are two different ends where I try to modify my voice. One end is when I'm being too technical and um, I get feedback from people not in my field, like, we have no idea what you're saying. You're talking to like 10 people. So I try to explain more and use more uh, outward facing language. The other end is when there's something that I really care about and a lot of people also really care about it and it's such a contentious, divisive topic and there's a huge social injustice. And on the one hand, you want to say something and on the other hand, you're just like, no, that's not what my platform is for. You know, I, I, people are already commenting on this, and I don't want to get sucked into that. And what if what I say is misinterpreted? So, yeah, I'm really cautious about tweeting, especially from the part of the world that I'm from. There's just oh, yeah. so many. Yeah. yeah. Can you say more about that? Um. I mean, for example, there was one um, professor that I heard about who commented on comments on. Um, events happening in the Middle East and got fired basically because it was, he, was, he was too emotional um, 
And so people interpret it as like hate speech, even though he felt he Stephen was. Stephen Salida, you mean? Um, um, at yeah, maybe. Of Illinois, yeah. Who now drives a bus? Right. A colleague of mine um, from SOM forwarded me this article, and I think he just felt that he was t talking about an injustice, and you know, he felt really passionately that this was wrong, and then it got interpreted as hate speech, and he got fired. So it, there's a fine balance between speaking up and not being heard in the most productive way. So there's, there's a way to communicate. So, so recent, without being, I, I've been working on trying to communicate information without it being possible for it to be an article in the Washington Times or Breitbart. So for instance, Jared Kushner recently had this interview with Axios, and I noticed that he was just parroting lines from Frank Luntz's 2009 Israel Project report. So what I did was I uh, tweeted uh, the Frank Luntz's Israel Project report <laughs> and a quote from it <laughs> that Kushner said and then linked it to Kushner's. So then nobody could take that. They just said, look, I just, he just tweeted a 100-page document and quoted this part. Well, that sounds familiar. Um, so, uh, so there are ways to communicate information without it being a headline. Because some like Salida, um, you know, the tweet that he got fired for, they couldn't fire. He had moved from a not from a tenure track from a tenured position to another position, but the deans hadn't yet approved his tenure, mm -hmm. and so he tweeted, "Netanyahu looks like he's wearing teeth of Palestinian children," uh, with and but Salida is Palestinian, so you know, <laughs> and and so. Uh, yeah, so it's very important, like any like short line can be, uh, and yeah. Allowing other people to say what you want to say. Allowing other people to say uh, what you want to say. That's a very useful tip. That's very useful. That's a great point. Yeah, and it has a kind of academic citation quality as exactly. well. Exactly. Um, and you can, you can just, just link to it and exactly. just well, retweet it. Well, importantly, you frame it. Here is someone who works for Qualcomm saying this. Here is somebody who's supposed to be enforcing the antitrust laws to protect consumers, and they're saying this, right? And that neither part of that is controversial. It's factual what their job is, and it's factual what they said. But most of the people, the person who wrote the article you're linking to is not framing it the way I'm framing it. And it's, so, it's, so it, it makes, uh, it, it, the reader then sees it in, a, in a different way and realizes, oh, there's a problem here. And the same thing with saying, yesterday I think I said, here's the emoluments clause of the Constitution. Here's a link to the National Archives right. so you can see the Constitution. That's all I said. This is what it means, right? So I didn't say anything. So you're planting the seeds. Right, it's like you, you're kind of wondering what this is and why people are talking about it. Hey, here's the actual text. Right. So um, we, you know, there are there are authoritarian governments. There are there's there are actual censors uh, around the world. Then there are then there's kind of one some self censor that um, who some of you have referred to. And we have a variety of states of tenure on our panel. Um, do, do you from any of your various institutions have you felt pressure to tweet or not tweet or to to be to be um, a little bit more judicious about what you what you say? I mean, all right, so I'll just say, I think Yale is a really famous university, and anybody who has a job here is sufficiently good that their own reputation is something that they care a lot about and can do lots of things with, whether at Yale or another place anywhere around the world. So for me, it's not, not about what the university wants, it's about what my mission is, which I believe is totally consistent with the university's mission, but I'm not thinking about it as a Yale problem, I'm thinking about it as a making the world a better place problem and allowing me to be effective in doing that for as long as possible, which means I need to stay relevant and truthful and direct and all those other good things. So I, I don't think there's a conflict, and I, I think maybe if you were asked at a different place, you would get a different answer, but I think, I mean, everybody here is super eminent and is probably thinking the same way, but I'll let you all answer well, no, for yourself. The question, you know, that I ask myself with every tweet, like, how is this going to hurt me, right? Is this going to really smack me in the face? That's equivalent to what yeah. does it mean that I'm a Yale professor 
tweeting this. Yeah. So it, it's you can't, particularly at an institution like Yale, you can't separate your identity from the fact that that's mm -hmm. who you are. Mm -hmm. Well, I never really thought about it in that way um, because I mostly, I like to use Twitter as a connector. This is just one of my hobbies and my passions in life. I love to connect people. And so when I tweet, it's mostly tweeting work that other people have done or work that I've done, like check out this paper or oh great job on this paper or look what this organization has just achieved. So it's nothing really that I feel I would be held accountable for or that I'm representing Yale or anything like that. I think that a university like Yale gives you a platform to better and more strongly connect people and Twitter is one channel through which you can do that. Yeah, so uh, I just like one of the ways that you can think about your relationship to the, your employer on Twitter is like, well, I better watch what I say. But another one is like the reach of your scholarship is much greater mm -hmm. to the extent that you're engaging with it, right? So, um, you know, papers that I haven't tweeted about, my mom has read them. And then uh, papers that I have, you know, thousands of people will engage in some form with it, be it like a, like a, like a pull quote from it or graphs from it, right? So um, I think it goes both ways, right? You have, to, you have to think about what this looks like as a professor at this institution, but it's also you're communicating, connecting to your field in ways that, um, in, you know, gets you invited to talks because people heard about your work because they saw you write about it on Twitter. And these are people who, um, you know, again, in our field, a lot of it's reputation based. They're going to be writing, um, if we're going to get really career about it, right, they're going to be writing your tenure letters and the like. So um, as someone untenured, it, it, I think it cuts both ways and it's important to, to think about that too. Uh, I, I prefer Twitter because on Facebook, I did embarrass Yale a little bit by, there was, so the incident that I got involved with was a philosophy professor gave a talk arguing that hom homosexuality is a disability and I used some potty language in describing the talk. <laughs> so some potty words, so I, no potty words on Twitter. Um, but, uh, but generally I think my, you know, I'm, I have the luxury of being tenured but I've tried just to speak my mind my whole life and if Yale's gonna fire me for that, Yale's gonna fire me for that. So those are some of the, the stickier um, moments of Twitter. What, what's the most fun for you? Where do you, um, I know, uh, you know, I, I, Michael, I know you, um, you, you, you do tweet about your family, about sports, and um, other, other fun things. Um, is that, does that take you down a rabbit hole, or is that a good rabbit hole? <laughs> no, I mean, all of it's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Um, <laughs> He said nervously. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, what, what I would say is that uh, when I think about what I'm like on Twitter, I think about who's watching. And a lot of the people who watch and follow and uh, engage with me on Twitter are, are graduate students, right? They're undergraduates. They're um, you know, recent graduates of our program, our MBA program. And so if I can be my, more of my full self in public, um, it invites more and different kinds of people to also be themselves um, in academic spaces. One of the things I really care about is um, having a more equitable university. And I think it's a value that Yale shares. We don't always um, uphold that value. And so um, one of the barriers to it is that you know, academics kind of all tend to look a certain way. But if you allow for more difference, you communicate that normatively, you can actually um, you know, create changes in norms. So I think that that too. So the two months during the NBA playoffs when my Twitter feed is just Warriors gifts, um, uh, you know, part of that is because I really like basketball a lot, but also it's part of, a part of its being a, a full person in a, in a visible space that allows other people to see that. I have a, a goofy example of that. Please. Um, trivial yet funny. Um, so there's a, and it's actually an example of um, things that Twitter can do that you don't imagine. So there's a bunch of historians who, uh, uh, you used to do it Sunday night, and now I think it's Saturday night. We're moving back to Sunday night. But um, at 9 o'clock at night, this community of historians goes on Twitter and watches a historical movie together. And live tweets our response to what we're seeing. It's, it's actually, if you're interested, it's hashtag H A T M, historians at the movies. So, very early on, and now the public is in there too, and it's become much bigger. Um, so, very early on in the process, I somehow mentioned that I'd never seen National Treasure. 
So then that became the movie we looked at, and I was screaming in outrage, you know, and you know, put lemon juice on the Declaration of Independence, right? So, but the writers of National Treasure saw this and beamed in. So then it was historians oh, cool. commenting on it and the writers commenting on it. And, and I, I literally did say, you put lemon juice on the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and the writers were like, they didn't realize it would seem like that big a deal to historians. <laughs> so that was just fun. But that's such a Twitter moment when yeah. suddenly you're like, wait, I'm talking to the writers? Like, and they're listening to historians? Like, how interesting is that? So I only use Twitter for work, but there's different kinds of work. And I think the most fun I had was um, when we were running a Kickstarter campaign with my organization to support a bunch of refugee women that were trying to crowdfund for a food truck to um, you know, help scale their catering company. So it's, it's a really random pitch. And um, so far, we had only had about 100 high net worth individuals that were in our close circle financing all these ventures. And when we did the Kickstarter campaign, we got 800 individuals from around the world, from countries that these women had never heard of and that they would have never dreamed that they, these people had heard of them. And so Twitter was a huge part of that because we were really systematic about when to tweet and who to tweet to. And we got Susan Sarandon to tweet it and you know celebrities and random things like that. So it was so much fun. And it was also exhausting because it lasted for two months. And you worry that people get fatigued from your campaign. Uh, but we had an awesome time, and it got funded, and it was just the most incredible experience ever. Um, Joanne, I know you've talked about um, uh, engaging with people, with, especially with founding fathers' fans. You have a real grab bag of people. Yes. Am I, am I that? There is a grab bag of people, yes. And uh, so all of you, I imagine, have engaged with people who, I mean, the, there's a teaching tool for people like your, your students, and people who uh, you know, are, are fact-based and so forth. And then there are people who, who are violently opposed to your ideas. What, what is it, um, uh, Jason, for instance, what, you know, what is that like when, people, when you're trying to, t do you engage and try to teach people who, who don't? I, I don't yeah. engage generally with the people who, I get a lot of sort of international tweets, I mean tweets in Portuguese, because I'm doing stuff in different countries, but um, that are, can be portrait. I mean, Brazil seems to have sort of, a, from what I recognize, somewhat violent <laughs> culture uh, directed <laughs> of, among their far right. But uh, I always engage extremely civilly. I always just, um, you know, if I engage, it's always, you know, respectfully and civilly on Twitter. I mean, Facebook, I think, was dangerous because it gave you this illusion of privacy. Um, and Twitter, I just try to model. Unfortunately, I come from a very combative profession, analytic philosophy, where the only form of a question is, you're wrong because <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So we're all used to, uh, and we're all used to odd views. Like I had a former colleague. Who, I have a colleague here at Yale who believes there's only one thing. So you know, I'm used to strange views. I'm used to Economists combat, like that combative too. discourse. <laughs> so, uh, so I only engage civilly and respectfully, even with, you know, neo-Nazis. So I, I would say that one big decision uh, that you make when you're on Twitter is which people to respond to. Right. So there are, there are plenty of people who disagree with me and write something that I don't even understand, or they write something that's totally ignorant and uninformed, and you think, I could teach them, but they're not paying tuition. <laughs> so that would be a long, complex process. I probably wouldn't succeed, and it would, it would take a lot of time, and I don't even know who they are. So the people that I tend to respond to and try to teach are the ones who have a name. Somebody who right. is actually another faculty yeah. member at another university, or is a reporter of some stature, or whatever. And a picture whatever. usually, too, right? So it's not anonymous. They're in it with their reputation as well. And then, and I'm doing the civil thing, explaining, yeah. here's why. Um, but I think if you try to respond to people, there's a danger that you go down into the mud pit if you respond to people who are not uh, operating at that same level. Uh, and so I try to avoid um, responding to people sort of will 
make a very provocative tweet in response and obviously trying to get me to engage. And I feel like right. engagement is itself an endorsement. And I am not go going to endorse people who are not um, on the debate in the same terms that I am. Yeah, the screenshot, the, the, the provocative, the trying to get you to, to respond angrily and get a screenshot of that. Mm -hmm. I've had like fake articles done of like provocative responses that I did you know, people provoking me and then me saying something and then they'll put a different context around it. So you have to be aware when you're on those platforms what people try to do to get you to respond in an uncivil way. But, you know, occasionally, and, and I do exactly what you do, which is um, if someone insults me, I'm not going to respond. If someone is screaming or, or doesn't, there's a whole category of pe people like that that I would not respond to. But I have had people contact me who are angry about something I've said, aren't insulting me, aren't venting anger at me, but, but clearly think differently than I do. And I clearly think, well, if you, if you knew this thing, right. it you might think differently. And right. I have responded to those people. And it, I have to confess, it happened more two years ago than it happens now. But more mm -hmm. than once, um, someone would say, well, you don't know what you're talking about, because blah, blah, blah. And I would say, right. well, and I would erase all emotion from my response. Right. And I would say, well, have you, know, you read this? It's interesting that you say that, but I actually think this, and this is why. And right. more than once, I had someone who clearly didn't agree with me politically respond by going, huh, I'm going to think about that. And it, it you know, it it's one person. Good. But right, it's like there was a moment of communication there that, you know, at least in my understanding of the current ethos, it's nice to know that you can have that moment. And again, mm -hmm. it, it reconfirms the fact that the teaching potential yes. of, of Twitter used in a savvy kind of a way is powerful. And also you don't win an argument by showing great emotion. You win an argument by remaining calm. Like when I was a Earl of junior faculty member, someone said, you know, you celebrate in the end zone before you've won the game too much and talks when I see that I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> you know, celebrating in the end zone takes away from your point. <laughs> It's interesting because there, I know there's a, there, I've seen an argument a lot on Twitter that especially um, women, people of color, and other marginalized groups are not responsible for teaching or they should be compensated in some way for teaching. But you're all teachers. So how does that, uh, do, does, it, does it sort of, does that trump the sort of sense of like, well, you know, I, I'm not here for your, your ed, ed, education. But it sounds like you kind of are. No, of course we are. Yeah, we're yeah. teachers. Yeah. yeah. It gets the mission. And if, I, if we can reach, you know, the number of people I can teach in the classroom is small. But if I can teach thousands of people on the internet, that's fantastic. And, and current students follow, mm -hmm. former students yep. follow. Yep. Um, so that's also, it's, it's continuing. And, and you can see them engaging further with ideas. So yeah, I think, I mean, that's the main reason I think I'm there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Michael, you would, you would agree with that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, with, with everything that's said, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I know we're running. Uh, maybe you have time for one or two questions? Yes. Relatively recently, a transgender woman in academic philosophy wrote about her experience being written out of the field because of discrimination she faced on Twitter specifically. Basically, existing online is precarious, but that precarity is not distributed accurately. Does having professional interactions take place on Twitter, create a sort of voice club. Well, so this is my field. My field is notorious for its viciousness, for its patriarchal sentiment, for its, uh, and many of the senior men in my profession have decided suddenly they're feminists because now, trend, now there's this movement of, I, I want to be careful about what I say, but now there's this movement of, uh, of uh, gender critical feminists who argue that transgender women aren't really women. And so suddenly there's all these people who I remember as having hated feminism. Suddenly they're like, I'm a feminist because I'm, <laughs> you know. So yeah, so there's this very, academic philosophy has often had a very vicious uh, part of because of our general culture and, and we're, we're um, you know, I, I've tangled with, uh, with the forces you've mentioned. And, uh, and it, you, know, you can't really call it a boys club because you have that UK group of feminists 
and you know they are feminists, and I respect their views, uh, but they're they're definitely championed by the the uh, men, senior men in philosophy, and, and so it's been a bad it's been a bad situation. Um, it's so intense that. You know, I mean, I, I tweet about transgender, I mean, I write about transgender issues. I've written about it in my book because all over the world, these far right movements, neo fascist movements, attack transgender women. You know, turning boys into girls is like, so I'm like, well, I'm fine for people to have discussions about gender, but how do you negotiate this fact? I think you're asking a really interesting question, which is that does this, is this a platform to reduce? the inequalities and disparities, or does it actually promote and exacerbate existing inequalities and disparities? And I'd love to hear what others think. So uh, in, for econ economics, it reduces them. I mean, if I can't be interrupted on Twitter, for example. I just, I tweet. So I would say there's no boys club. I, I don't perceive any kind of boys club. I don't perceive any kind of um, issue in the economics debate. Anyway. But I do, I do think, related to your question, um, People with privilege of various sorts have louder voices because they can, right? And, and they're not as vulnerable. And Twitter does do that. But you know what that then means to me is, OK, I'm a tenured professor. I teach at Yale. I can get I out should there and be say something, right? I can say something that I feel needs to be said, and I, I have that privilege, and I can use that privilege. So I wouldn't say it's a boys club. Um, but I feel it's important to have a loud female voice. And, you know, the fact that other women, you women graduate students, high school girls, have responded that way made me think about that in a way that I hadn't thought about it before. Well, in philosophy, I should say, there are very vocal women feminists attacking transgender women. So it's a very bad situation. And I do not weigh on, in on it because whenever, I, whenever a male weighs in on it, they're accused of being a misogynist. So if, you, if I would say I stand up, so it's a very particular situation mm -hmm. and you know, 100% of the, yeah, it's, but it has to do with this privilege, you know, it's complicated. Uh, I think one more quick question and then we have to wrap up. Please, yes. I'll go first because I'm short. I don't. That's not why I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter to talk about antitrust and healthcare policy to people who are interested in that. And if they're interested in me, that's fine, but I'm not trying to reach out to anybody. I guess I'll be the opposite because that's the whole point. That's the whole reason that I'm on Twitter is to engage with, well, I want to engage with people within public health and also outside public health. Like now I'm in a management school and I want to get people who so far are not interested in social entrepreneurship or social impact broadly speaking to be interested in that. And you have to use certain hashtags. Um, but, but yeah, I think that um, it's true. You can, be, you can go down into a vortex and get even more specific, or you can really create a snowball effect. It could go either way. I, I avoid, I mean, I've, a lot of my life has been trying to avoid the, the ugliness of my field. And I'm very happy to be involved in a larger political discourse outside of like philosophy, the gossip about my profession. Whereas for me, a big part of my sense of being a historian is um, public history. Right. Is that historians should be talking to the public. I give public lectures. I, have, I co host a podcast. You know, I do this in a lot of ways. And what I now understand is that Twitter is another way to do that. And a powerful one might not be recognized that way yet. But, but I, I think, to me, kind of like what Teresa was saying, that's the point of it, is to not just talk to my colleagues, although I love right. talking to them. But it, it really is to, to reach out. It's hard to do philosophy, a philosophical argument, in 280 characters. <laughs> you already read the critique of pure reason. Uh, uh, well, uh, Michael, do you want the last word on that? No, no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, here is uh, everyone that you see before you. Um, I hope you'll follow everybody. Everyone's immensely um, 
edifying and entertaining, and um, it's a, a treat to be um, to know you all on Twitter, and uh, in some cases to know you in person. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily.